Good morning and welcome to Cleveland Park Congregational United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming congregation. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. By way of housekeeping, um, a reminder for all of us, whether we're worshiping online or in person here in the sanctuary, please mute any devices. And if you're here with us in the sanctuary, I invite you to wear your name tag. It's helpful for all of us to uh, learn each other's names. We welcome back Liz Prunicki for our third week with her as our July Preaching Fellow. And both this week and then on August 6th, Liz is offering a coffee hour conversation on major themes in the book of Mark and a brief study in prophecy. So feel free to mark your calendars and feel warmly invited to stick around for those. By now, everyone should have received a mid-year giving statement either by snail mail or by email. Thank you so much for giving. We really appreciate everyone's gifts, especially recognizing that all of our costs are increasing, so thank you. A reminder that at any point throughout the year, if you wish to change up your pledge, you can do so by emailing Robert Glass, our financial secretary, whose email is in your bulletin under the mid-year giving statements blurb. And lastly, it is time to clean out the lost and found, which is located in our parlor. Uh, just over, over that way. So feel free to take a look and do so soon because we will give everything away by the end of August if it is not claimed. So I do believe those are all of our announcements. And we're in. So Heidi, welcome to church. We begin this morning's worship by lighting candles of hope and healing. Today's service will focus on the stories that we tell ourselves. What is the story of Christianity and who is telling it? Please join me now for the call to worship. This is the day that God has made. Loving God. From the limitations of our assumptions. The image of God. Each as our own person. Let us worship God. And now join me in our opening prayer. Gracious God, you show up to us in unexpected ways. A mother hen protecting us under wing. A breasted God who nurtures and provides for us. We give you thanks to you, Holy One, 
for showing up in our lives, for creating the conditions in which we live, for giving us space to become ourselves and loving us through the growing pains. To God be the glory. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn. Number 75, I was there to hear your warning cry. Please be seated. I'd like to center our time for silent reflection this morning by first sharing a selection from Lauren Winter's book, Wearing God. I know that in this congregation, you all have been in a journey thinking about new ways to think about God, not just relying on masculine father, he, him words. And I think that Lauren Winter offers a wonderful um, opportunity in that prompt. So after, after the selection, I'll invite us to take a deep breath and then I'll ring a singing bell a few times. I hope that this selection will ground your reflection in new ways as you consider God's love and enduring presence in your life. So she writes, none of these images, rock, shepherd, vine, captures the whole of God because as Benjamin Myers puts it, God is too full too communicative, too bright and piercing to be easily spoken of. The euphony of biblical speech about God, about what God is like and how we with our finite minds might imagine God, is a summons to revel in God's strange abundance. I go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for an afternoon and when I come out, I try to describe it to you, but all I'm really describing is the blue Turkish bowl or that Flemish painting, or possibly the sandwich I ate in the cafe at lunchtime. There is, to again borrow from Myers, too much there to describe. 
And yet I sat in front of that blue bowl for an hour. I sketched it, I paid attention to it, and I paid attention to myself in its presence. What I can say about the bowl is, if partial, also true and enlivening. The Bible gives us this surfeit of images in order to rule out literalism. And the Bible gives us these images because each image holds a different way, maybe many different ways, into our life with God. Each image invites a different response from us, a different way that we might be with and for God. So let's take a deep breath in and out. God is with us. As we go from a time of reflection, maybe thinking about the things that we've done in the past week that we maybe shouldn't have, the opportunities that we missed to show grace and kindness and love to our neighbors, we also move over here to our baptismal waters, where every week someone comes up to me after worship and says, did the baby not show up? <laughs> this is a remembrance of baptism, an opportunity to remember what it is that our traditions and our rituals bring to our lives, a reminder that these rituals unite us to one another and to God, that there is nothing we can ever do that will separate us from the love of God, that God loves us so much, God will chase after that love and bond with us yet again. And so listen now to the sound of love poured out, reminding that we are connected to one another in baptism, in friendship, in love, and in Christian community. And let us pray now the prayer that Jesus taught our friend and our neighbor, our mother and our father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be. to be Christian. We practice that in this space where we unmute ourselves on Zoom, we stand up, and we share the grace and peace of God with one another. Peace be with you. Good morning. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Another reading from the gospel according to Mark. As he taught, he said, beware of the scribes who walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury for all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. And may the gospel be more to us than mere words. May you produce in us strong convictions. In your holy name we pray. Amen. In our gospel reading from Mark, we have a, we have a juicy story today, friends. Who here has heard the story of the poor widow giving all of her money away? Excellent, excellent. Maybe you heard it preached on a Sunday morning, maybe it was in a Sunday school class or adult education, maybe someone extremely bold used it for as the scriptural foundation for a stewardship series. <laughs> the common reading of this text is extremely on the nose for stewardship Sunday and for mid season giving I didn't even know that that was on the agenda today, but maybe there's more than one reading. What story about the poor widow are you familiar with. Is there really only one way to tell her story? And that's what we're going to be talking about today, stories. What do we include in them? What gets left on that editing room floor? And how should we think about the conclusions that we draw about how we should live in the world and how we should think about ourselves from the limited information we've been given? I'm sure that most people who've heard the story of the poor widow are accustomed to celebrating her. She gives all that she has in the world to the temple, not just the money that won't even be missed. Very literally, this woman gives all that she has. My goal for our time together this morning is to provide an alternate way to think about the poor widow. You're especially welcome to bring any critiques. Uh, of, of this reading to the adult education coffee hour after worship today where we will discuss major themes in the book of Mark. This story is an excellent example of many of those themes. Jesus's tension with the Roman political religious establishment, his quest for justice, and his overwhelming manliness. I hope that none of you have forgotten from my first week here that above all in the gospel of Mark, Jesus is extraordinarily manly. There are literally thousands of narratives that we tell ourselves that impact how we feel about ourselves and how we live our lives. In Isaiah, the scripture speaks to that power of story, that a messenger will come and deliver good news, 
Prisoners will be released. Those who mourn will be comforted. The brokenhearted will be bound up. This good news buoys the afflicted and gives them hope. And in Christian tradition, Jesus is this messenger doing this work throughout the Gospels. If the idea of these many thousands of stories impacting our lives sounds helplessly abstract, let me give you an example. I'm an American. I can say that. And when I invoke America, every person in this room will have both a common understanding of what that means, but will also think slightly differently about that story. Depending on who I'm talking to, that word can immediately invoke a legacy of genocide and enslavement that is irredeemable. But it can also evoke patriotism, pride, and feelings of exceptionalism. How we think about our Americanness, whether it is a point of pride or shame or somewhere in between, that story has an effect on us, and it shapes in real and tangible ways how we interact with other people, the sorts of media we consume, and the decisions we literally make every day. This is true about identity markers like nationality, but it's also true for most other descriptors in our lives. There is a narrative about what it means to be a father or a wife or a non-binary person. A person who likes motorcycles also fits a sort of narrative. So do blondes. You can't escape it. And we either use these narratives as a sort of shorthand to give guidance and meaning to our lives, or we can rebel against them. This is essentially what we're doing when we ask ourselves a question like, what does it mean to be a woman in 2023? I can like the answer or not, but regardless, I'm making decisions into a, in response to a prompt that other people have given me. Some of these stories have a positive effect on our lives. If we think of being American as a great honor, but one that comes with a tattered and complicated history, we may be open to thinking about how we can make life better for everyone instead of just a select few. But that same story can trigger in someone else feelings of being threatened or scared. Many of us have taken the prompt in the past few years to reflect on what our American identity means to us. Ironically though, it's not the unpleasant stories that necessarily have the biggest impact on us. Because there are so many stories that we don't even realize we're living in. One such story here is homophobia. If you grow up in a household or in a community that does not affirm the beauty of your love, if the story you are told is one of conformity, heteronormativity, and love that is based on conditions, then it is extremely likely that you will internalize that story and believe the lie that you are less worthy of love. It's one reason that queer youth are at such a high risk for mental health emergencies. The insidious thing about these internalized stories is that we are scarcely aware of the ones that have the tightest hold on us. It took me until my mid-20s to realize that I had some baggage to deal with, with internalized sexism. Before that, whenever I saw a woman who seemed threatening, if she was brilliant or beautiful or seemed successful, <laughs> I would feel an intense and immediate stab of distaste. <laughs> But now when that happens, because it still happens from time to time, we are always growing. But now, now when that happens, I know to pause. I know to take that emotional reaction as an opportunity to reflect and not invest too hard in those feelings. Stories shape who we are. We need to be aware of the stories that are forming us and malforming us in order to consent to make healthier decisions about how we want to live our lives. The story of the poor widow is fascinating and straightforward. A crowd surrounds the treasury at the temple in Jerusalem and starts putting in money. The rich people put in lots of money, and then a poor widow approaches, and she puts in all that she has, two measly copper coins, literally the smallest denomination available at the time. And Jesus tells the disciples, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. That's all that Jesus says. Some contributed out of their abundance, but she gave all that she had. You'll notice, however, that Jesus doesn't include judgment statements. He doesn't say explicitly what is good and what is bad. Even the fanciest study Bible doesn't include stage directions. 
or if it does, those are not canon. <laughs> if it does, they have taken some liberties there. We don't have any way to guess Jesus's intonation or body language or any other clues that would give more evidence by the way he said these words. All we have are facts. Some people gave out of their abundance, but she gave all that she had. And if we only look to Mark 12, 41 through 44, we could let that word, but, connecting those two clauses, do a lot of interpretation. The word but is probably the biggest reason that we think Jesus is coming to a judgment about the small donation being more notable than the large sums of money. The rich people did this, but the poor woman did that. And if you're only looking at these four verses, it's comfortable and logical that but indicates a preference for the poor widow's offering and a judgment about her donation. But if we zoom out a little bit, we get an entirely different read on that story. This is first century Palestine under Roman imperial rule and the temple politics of that time are really closely aligned with the religious community. At this point in the story, Jesus has made his way to Jerusalem from Galilee. This is the Monday of Holy Week. It's just days before Jesus is about to be crucified. Mark 12 is a series of texts and rhetorical sparring matches between Jesus and the temple scribes, including that famous test if people of Jerusalem should pay their taxes to the Roman imperial authority, to which Jesus says, give to, emperor, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and give to God the things that are God's. Just before that episode, Jesus had overturned the money changers' tables and he'd cleansed the temple. All that to say, Jesus is extremely fired up about political and religious injustices, especially concerning finances, when he then turns his attention to the poor widow and her offering. This is why I chose our scripture reading to begin at 1238 instead of 1241. You'll notice in verse 40 that Jesus denounces the scribes because they devour widows' houses. And then who's the next character we meet? A widow. It's snack time. <laughs> if you still prefer the generosity read of this text, let me just point out that the narrative takes an even more stark tonal shift just after it, at the start of Mark 13, when Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple. Instead of reading the story of the poor widow as a pious woman who gave out of her incredible generosity, I think that the theologian, Seon Hee Kim, is on the right track when she suggests that the poor widow's actions are actually the climax of Jesus's whole teachings of Mark 1 through 12 up to this point. Because she gives to Caesar what is Caesar. She's the only person who's embodied his message. The coins that she tosses into the temple treasury are embossed with the face of the emperor. And just as this world has taken everything from that poor widow, by returning those last two coins she has, she signals her refusal to participate in that system anymore, putting her trust instead in the kingdom of heaven and doing as Jesus taught only moments before. This story is emblematic of why the religious and political order of the time will come to an end. This poor widow is the connection between Jesus' teaching and his announcement that the temple will be destroyed because she understands what Jesus is doing in the world disrupting Roman political oppression and refusing to participate on those terms as a subjected and oppressed poor widow. Okay, but is the story of the poor widow a narrative that has shaped our lives so profoundly that it influences our decision making? For some of us, maybe. Maybe that stewardship campaign was really convincing when it was based in the poor widow. But for others, maybe not. The point of reframing this narrative in the Bible isn't to take away a reading of, of the text that you may have identified with, but it's to demonstrate that the same story will have countless perspectives and that those perspectives will have great material consequences on how we choose to live our lives. Biblical literalists and proponents of biblical inerrancy both have a tendency to flatten the text in their quest to find literal meaning and true facts in stories that were written thousands of years ago by hundreds of different people. In congregations that value inerrancy, it can be difficult to provide a new reading of the text. 
one that is just as faithful to the written word as the other, if there's, always, if there's already a prescribed correct reading. But most people don't recognize how often a correct reading of a text is simply filled with someone else's interpretation. In the story of the poor widow, Jesus just says the word but, and we come to a huge conclusion that that but indicates praise. But it doesn't have to indicate praise. Another interpretation is just as valid. To borrow from the UCC's excellent slogan, God is still speaking. The Bible is begging for us to breathe life into these countless perspectives and find new avenues to be transformed by the stories of our ancestors. And what is the story of our faith? In the week ahead, I encourage everyone here to reflect on the stories that shape our lives most directly. If I had planned the adult education hour topic last night when I was working on this sermon instead of months ago when I submitted scripture and sermon titles, I would have led us in an exercise to do exactly this, to force us to think concretely about the stories that are the most important to who we are. For this reason, I also think that we should set aside a particular attention for what it means to each of us to be Christian. If you're like me, a progressive liberal Christian from a progressive mainline denomination, which I know that almost everyone in this room is, then it can be tempting. <sighs> That's amazing. <laughs> then it can be tempting when prompted to describe our faith by saying, yes, I'm a Christian, but don't worry, I'm not one of those Christians. <laughs> UCC author Lillian Daniels has an excellent book that summarizes these feelings exactly in its pithy title, Tired of Apologizing for a Church I Don't Belong To. Often I don't even know what exactly I'm avowing or disavowing in my faith when I assume that I'm not the prototypical Christian, the one that others expect when they hear that word. But I do know that when I lived with roommates, every time someone new would come to our house they'd look at all the bookshelves on the first floor of our capitol hill home and they'd sort of awkwardly pause and say uh wow there's a lot of bible stuff here <laughs> with a very audible discomfort about how best to proceed next and then a roommate would laugh and say yeah liz is super religious but <laughs> get this she also loves gay people <laughs> And then to my equal discomfort, the guests would often look like this was the wildest and most unbelievable thing that they had ever heard. And let me be clear, I don't associate this confusion about my identity with persecution. This nation does not have a problem with persecuting Christians, despite some narrative in the, in the media. Uh, this is a nation built on Judeo-Christian values that employs language and customs that speak directly to our traditions. We're not persecuted. But we are in a moment where being Christian is no longer a default. And so that shared story has splintered. If we choose to be Christian now in 2023, we do need to have some sort of reason why when people ask. The story I tell myself of my faith, which admittedly I'm still working on, is that Jesus welcomes all, loves all, and is longing to be in relationship with each and every person in this world, Christian or not. But even more than that, the story of Christianity is transformative. I mentioned in my first sermon that my experience of Christianity, even though I was born and raised in the church, felt more like a conversion. Like I'd been going through the motions of showing up and then suddenly woke up one morning, a totally different, kinder, gentler, and more patient person. And so when I think about what it means to be Christian, I don't erase the difficult parts of the history, the crusades, the homophobia, the domestic abuse, nor do I try to do some sort of balancing act that puts all the good on one side and puts the bad on the other side and tries to weigh them out like there's an answer there. I'm here because I've been transformed by the better through my relationship with this institution and the stories that it connects in me. In Christianity, the story that is the foundation of our faith is not only transformative, it is transcendent. As we'll discuss next week in the Gospel of Mark, getting closer to the passion and the crucifixion, Jesus defeats death. He subverts the power structures of the day. And regardless of your theology of the cross, the crucifixion and resurrection are stories that ground Christianity 
in the belief that absolutely anything is possible. That we are not, that we are a people who do not concede failure. Not to say that we ignore it or are ignorant of the difficulties in our lives, but that we will choose to find a new hope. And if we are having a really hard time finding hope one day ourselves, then that's why we come to church and let someone else find it for us. So thanks be to God for this story that shapes and molds and inspires us. Help us live into that. Amen. Now please stand as you are able and join me in singing, I Want to Tell the Story. Please be seated. We have now, it is now the time in our service when we share our deep joys and concerns silently out loud or with God and with one another. And with the prayers that came in the, the Tuesday weekly prayer newsletter. And then, and then we'll go to the chat and people joining us in person. God, hear our prayers for Krista's sister, Jessie who is recovering from brain surgery and likely facing a long battle. Here are prayers for all friends and family of our congregation who are managing long-term health concerns and diagnoses. Here are prayers for local neighborhoods that are experiencing violence and all those who respond to it. 
And hear our prayers for everyone everywhere who is sick, grieving, and in need. And God, we give thanks today for Denise's successful hip replacement last week, for the joy and treasure of siblings, of strong family connections that continue to be loving even, even in death. And we give thanks for our congregation's July birthdays. <laughs> Very important. Now let us take a moment of silence to hold these joys and concerns while I invite everyone joining on Zoom to unmute themselves and share their pray prayers whenever y'all on Zoom are ready. Are there any concerns that we'd like to share in the congregation? If so, Serena will come around with a mic. We're gonna go wild. We're gonna, I know you guys usually separate it into concerns and then celebrations, but we're gonna mix it all up. Uh, Cause I, I wanna, I, I wanna start by celebrating that my people are here. I'm so delighted. <laughs> I am so grateful for the opportunity to be in, in, in worship and in congregation with you all from Emmanuel Presbyterian Church for five years and that you all are here this morning. It's such a, it's such a joy. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and of course, I'm grateful that Cleveland Park Congregational has had me here so that my friends can come visit me. Thanks be to God. Um, closer? Okay. Just a prayer for direction and for protection for our children and for our families and for safe travels back. Hmm. I want to thank John Vole, who's on Zoom today was sitting in front of me last week when he remembered his sister's birthday and said that we should all do that. And so somehow I remember that this week as I um, thought about my sister who died 33 years ago at only age 37. Um, and, you know, she would probably be ruling the world right now. So, um, you know, it was kind of hard to be her sister. So I put those really dramatic flowers on there for her. I'm sorry she didn't get to be who she should have been. I thought I saw another hand up at some point. Okay, let's go to God in prayer. Let's take a deep breath in and out. Gracious God, we give thanks that you bring us here in a place like this, a beautiful congregation with a rich history that his, has its own story to tell. These walls have a story. They bear the memories of everyone who has walked in here before members of the congregation who are new this week and people who have been here for the past 50 years of their lives, folks who were baptized here and buried here. Places like this have a rich and beautiful story that shapes who we are. And we are grateful. We are moved by the opportunity to share our stories into this space where we can be buttressed by the love of the other, by the people who are sitting next to us, in a space where old friends will come to new spaces and a place where we can remember the love that exists beyond the grave. That we give thanks for the ways that people who have died have impacted our lives, that their stories continue to be told, that we can continue to be moved by that relationship. Gracious God, we ask for prayers of safety, for traveling mercies as people head out on summer plans, head back, come home. We ask for safety in the traveling and wherever they may be. We ask that your comforting embrace wrap around every person who is sick and grieving and in need of healing. 
and Holy One, as we go from this place, we remember that your love carries us. Your love weaves its way through each of our relationships. Your love is the foundation of the love we feel for ourselves and for one another. To God we give thanks. Amen. So before, before I sing, um, if you'll notice, uh, the, the name of the song is Candle on the Water. Um, for those of you that were here before the service and saw my silliness, I was doing Sound of Music. Um, this is not from that, uh, but I do want to tell you that this song is from a movie called Pete's Dragon. Um, it is a Disney movie. Uh, there was a movie named Pete's Dragon made about a decade ago. That's not the one. I need you to dig further. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this Peep Dragon, I think, was made in the 80s, um, and I would invite you to look it up. Like I said, it is a Disney movie. Um, Peep's Dragon's name is Elliot, and uh, the movie is part live action um, and part animation. Elliot the Dragon is, in fact, animated. Um, they, the, the actress, um, for some of you, um, you may know the, the singer of this song. Um, the actress in the movie is Helen Reddy. Um, and she's the one who sings this song. So anyway, it's not my personal mission to get everybody to see Peace Dragon, but I love this song and I love the movie. <laughs> Jesus leads us to do bold things, like find new hope in opportunities that had seemed foreclosed. And he invites us to recognize that maybe he's asking us to give away all of our money. Maybe he's trying to tell us something else. But he certainly invites us to think about the ways 
that money, along with so many other things, is never really ours to begin with. Instead, we are stewards of this world and of our community that we are called to love and care for our resources. So this is the time in our service when we receive the offering in grateful appreciation for the life and work of this beloved community. If you're in the sanctuary, you can contribute as the offering plate is passed. You're also welcome to take out your phone and scan the QR code on the back of the bulletin. For those on Zoom, the link to the donate page is in the chat room. Thank you all for your gifts of time, talent, and treasure. Let us give now to the glory of God. benediction. And after the postlude, I hope you'll join me in the parlor for coffee hour and maybe stay for the adult education hour. Our closing hymn this morning is number 595, Be Thou My Vision.
stories that shape your life, dig into the ones that inspire you, and be cautious of those that cause you harm. While we can't remove ourselves from the stories, we can be more aware of their perspectives and go from this place remembering that this faith grounds you in a story that is hopeful, redemptive, and filled with love. Now may the grace, grace, mercy, and peace of God, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer be and abide with each and every one of us today and every day. Amen.